it's my great pleasure to have you here after the summer. Well, it's still summer, but uh, the summer we uh, offer the breakfast and science seminars to the PhD students. So um, we are going to have two PhD students today uh, presenting. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Murray, CIBM EG Chevenin section head, and who will be chairing the session. Thank you, Micah. So I'll have to introduce Nicole from a distance. Uh, we have the privilege of, of having uh, Nicole uh, Skiritz, uh, who will talk about her work, uh, which is somewhat linked to the first talk about learning and memory, uh, in particular of second languages. Uh, Nicole did her um, bachelor's training uh, originally in, in Northwest Germany in Osnabrück, uh, before then taking a bit of a, a travel uh, to Mexico and then uh, to Fribourg, uh, where she got a second bachelor's. Uh, both uh, of them are in cognitive science and then psychology. She then did her master's as well in Fribourg before starting her PhD uh, at Uni Distance in Brig. Uh, I have the privilege of collaborating with her and her supervisors on uh, not only how people learn a second language, but also what tools can be used to help people learn, uh, and in particular, uh, both adults and children. So I'll get out of the way and let Nicole talk about her exciting research uh, and look forward to the discussion thereafter. Um, yeah, thank you, Micah, for the introduction. And also from my side, good morning, everyone. Um, my title already gives you a tiny bit of a spoiler of the results, but let's first start in the beginning. When we consider language, we have a tool that brings us all together. Like today, we can exchange over a topic like science, but when we consider how do we learn a language, in the past decade, we have seen that there is a bunch of mobile assisted language learning applications on the market. What they all have in common is tiny bits that are basically um, based on the fundamental learning and um, language learning in general from psychology. They all differ a tiny bit in terms of design, also the offer which languages can be learned um, however, they also combine learning strategies, but the point is, is there a reason to combine them? Is there a benefit in terms of um, only focusing on vocabulary learning, for example? Learning strategies that have been identified to be a, a, of benefit is, for example, using retrieval practice. That is the active testing or the active recall of information that has been learned instead of just using uh, rote learning or exposure passively of the content, then we have spacing. Spacing is um, when you distribute the learning content over a semester, for example, instead of massing the content into uh, bigger chunks. Then we have multisensory learning where you address multiple senses at the same time, instead of just addressing one sense. And at last we have corrective feedback, meaning when you do an error, you actually get to see a corrective version or an explanation what has been uh, the mistake. Each of them has been shown to be sufficient when it comes to uh, efficient in terms of learning, also in terms of vocabulary learning or associative uh, learning. However, it might be appealing also to combine them to see whether there's a benefit or not. That is also what uh, mobile phone applications do, but the literature or the research on combining them is really small. I can show you some potential outcomes that have been summarized. And there we start with the very first one that is the most desirable outcome. It is called the complementary view. When you have a look at the right hand side, you see a visualization of what the study outcome would be like. We manipulate the proportion of retrieval, for example, and combine another learning strategy on top. Here, participants, for example, performed acute recall task. And what you can see is that there is an increase as soon as at least one strategy is applied. When there's a combination of both strategies, there's an additive effect. This is what all mobile phone applications are assuming is actually the case. But research has also identified other strategy outcomes. That is, for example, the redundancy view that states so you have a look at the visualization again. Here, the difference is that this additive effect does not come up because multiple cognitive mechanisms might be overlapping. Therefore, just using one strategy is sufficient. 
And then we have also um, what we could consider uh, a conditional relationship. What we have here is we do not expect a main effect of testing or of retrieval practice unless there is another strategy put on top. And what we can um, eventually use is not just behavioral measures, we can also go beyond and use new physiological correlates of learning to identify aspects that could be of interest when it comes to designing mobile phone applications. And what you can see on the left side is um, what we use a passive sponge-based electrode system. We use uh, electroencephalography with 64 channels. Um, on the bottom, you see uh, the location of all channels in the standardized uh, system as EEG measures um, voltage changes that are really small. Those uh, signal is then um, driven by uh, amplifier and what you see on the monitor is basically a subset of a wave-like pattern for each channel on the right side. Uh, on top, you see some colored lines. And let's have a closer look at what those lines actually stand for. On top, you see a short abbreviation for each of those colored lines, indicating that there's a sequence that is almost repeating in the same way. Uh, there is an S1 starting, continuing with an S2. Then we have a difference between S3 and S4, followed by S5, 6, again 5, and 8. So what is interesting here is that uh, those markers or those labels represent something that is presented on the screen to the participant, or that it is um, a motor action, for example, a key press by the participant. Let's first divide both sequences into individual trials. And this could look like as follows. So if we have a look at the first trial, you see that, for example, S1 could stand for a fixation cross, followed by an image, here a bird, and then we see the word bird itself. The participant is then asked to uh, push a button, either the left or the right arrow key on the keyboard to identify this as a consistent or correct representation of the image or a false representation of the image. So we have the button press, then also identif uh, identifying whether the participant knew or guessed by making the decision. And eventually we have the button press represented. And for the second trial, it looks roughly the same but there's a difference. Instead of bird, now the participant gets to see the word cat. So here of interest is of course um, that the participant also identifies this as incorrect combination. So if we continue again, we have the button press and the second response. What we can actually conclude is that we have one trial that corresponds to a congruent pair meaning there is a semantic relationship that is consistent, but in another one, we have an incongruent pairing. So the, uh, here the goal is to make the participant aware of the mistake. What we can then summarize is the wave-like signal that is represented at this time point when the second word is presented. So we average all trials that are represented by congruent pairing, meaning everything around S3, and compare those with the S4 averages. And to show you how this would look like, for example, at one channel that is PZ, so the, um, the last wave-like form, what we can have then is two lines, one representing all congruent trials and compare them with all incongruent pairs. You see that there is one huge gap. That is reflecting the so-called N400 effect. What we see is that the N400 effect reflects semantic inconsistency or incongruency. Therefore, for all incongruent pairs, we see a negative deflection that is characterized also by a higher activation in parietal areas. So we use not only behavioral, but also new physiological measures to eventually um, identify how do learning strategies interact when we're using mobile assisted language learning tools. And we also want to use the N400 effect as a robust measure of associative learning um, and investigate whether the modulation that happens is also reflected by the N400. So can we use the N400 
in a gradual manner to identify which learning strategy or which combination of learning strategies works best to identify which um, aspects of mobile phone applications uh, should be considered. So we collected data of 83 healthy adults that underwent three um, experimental sessions. So at first we had um, a purely behavioral assessment with cognitive test battery to assess, for example, nonverbal intelligence using the Raven uh, mattresses or assessing also sustained attention on top we used a vocabulary test where 48 stimuli or 48 <laughs> word pairs were asked to be learned. Then we had a new physiological assessment with the EEG, the same system that I showed you before. And then we had an intervention lasting two weeks where participants were assigned either to a distributed learning group or a mass learning condition. And they were asked to use a mobile phone application where we were able to control for those learning strategies and eventually use also the data and derive which combinations were responsible for which learning outcome. So we use Finnish as a target language to ensure that none of the participants were actually uh, familiar with the language. And at last, we had another experimental session where the behavioral outcome in terms of the vocabulary tests and the new physiological assessment took place again. So some participants were excluded from the EEG analysis due to uh, data quality, but to show you how the learning strategies were implemented in the app, I will show you some examples um, to modulate or to um, manipulate the proportion of retrieval. We had, for example, the word pair Lintu is the Finnish translation for BERT. Uh, here presented on top, and you get to see uh, a button that says play. You hear then the word in the spoken version and the translation represented by an image and the bottom uh, sound represents the sound that is associated with this image. So this is a purely passive uh, observation. It's only um, with a continue button, you only have the option to see the image, the word and play each sound once. When it comes to retrieval practice, here we have an example for using microphone input. Uh, so the word is presented, the participant is then asked to provide the oral answer into the microphone. Uh, alternative options were, for example, text input or also using multiple choice as a test option. When it comes to feedback type, we used either the corrective version, meaning when there was a mistake, the correct answer is presented again or in a short version, only representing that it's false. And then they could continue to the next trial. And when it comes to multisensory learning, this was uh, manipulated on both levels, meaning for encoding trials and also for retrieval trials. So I will show you only uh, an example for encoding trials, but it could also um, correspond to a retrieval trial here in a multisensory uh, condition. You see two items on top and two items on the bottom meaning the written version combined with its uh, spoken representation or addressing also the image with the sound that is associated with this word pair. In a unisensory condition, you only see one item on top and one on the bottom. So the task of interest that I was using um, was for once the vocabulary test. So acute recall task that corresponds to the potential outcomes that we were originally having a look at. And also the recognition task, basically the association of the word and uh, an image can also be transferred across language. So what we used instead was then a sequence of using the written word pair of either the L1 or the L2 represented word first, followed by its translation. Meaning what we expect is um, if participants know the translation, they might also identify the incongruent and congruent pairs, while if they don't know it, so before learning, there is no difference. So the design I use in terms of the vocabulary test at first, the performance in terms of accuracy uh, from the recognition task, uh, we took consideration of the response the signal um, detection theory using sensitivity criterion C as well as the beta. And eventually, in terms of the amplitude or the N400 more specifically, we use the amplitude difference across time of the old school way using a predefined uh, time window and nine predefined channels. 
Additionally, we use uh, microsite analysis to use, um, we use the global map dissimilarity. And this is only uh, in a gray shade um, highlighted because this is still in progress. So I can show you how far this uh, goes and what is the content behind it, but no statistics on the last one. And eventually the factors, of course, um, the session as before and after the intervention is used as one factor using congruency uh, to determine the N400 effect in terms of the only the recognition task uh, is used. And then we use two combinations, uh, two by two combinations of retrieval practice with the other learning strategies um, to identify whether we can reflect the potential outcomes, the views that I showed in the beginning. So the results are quite straightforward. If we have a look at the first uh, image, we can see the result before and after learning in terms of the vocabulary test. So we can see that this uh, represents an increase. Same for the behavioral part in the recognition class, and also for the N400 effect in terms of the predefined time window channels, we see an overall effect of time that could be indicative for learning. What we do not see, however, if we split this down into main effect of learning, how this uh, learning, how each learning strategy per se, or even the combinations of learning strategies affected this learning outcome, we do not see any difference. And therefore, we extended our analysis to also using microstate analysis because uh, we failed to. Uh, determine a modulation, even on the N400 level, as you have seen on the previous slide, you see an overall increase, but also individuals where you see a decrease. Let's have a look at those three, for example. Um, <clears throat> so we extended our analysis to using microstates, what you see as an example here, um, a single subject represented by condition only after learning. So here we would like to see the N400 effect, of course. Uh, you see all epochs by condition averaged by channel. So you see uh, 64 lines for each channel. Um, and what we eventually use from here is um, compared to the other approach, we see that there is changing dynamics. If you have a look only at the left-hand side with the three topological maps, you see that at each time point, the topological dynamics change. Same for the other condition. So we cannot necessarily use the previous approach where we just see the N400 effect, but we cannot go beyond to identify uh, a modulation effect. So what we can do is then eventually we transfer all the 64 lines into one single line that is a global field power. Here you see a single line representing the upper image uh, in, a, in a facilitated format. Then we get this output by participant, meaning for 77 participants, we get the same and we can analyze on a group level what is the difference by condition. So here I put both lines in a single figure because the differences are quite small. However, what we can distinguish is the grayish line represents the congruent conditions, while the incongruent ones where we would then see a negative deflection is represented by the red line. So we have small differences, but let's have a look at the intersecting point that is roughly at 0.5 uh, that also corresponds to a stimulus onset time of 300 milliseconds. It's shortly before, but let's say it's 300 and everything before, or at least the upper uh, figure, if we have a look, um, you can see that the gray line is above the red line, meaning there's a small difference that is on group uh, level, um, still differing than the baseline, everything before, uh, beyond, uh, before uh, 0.35. And after the intersecting point of 0.5, uh, you see that the red line takes over and there we have higher, um, a higher power compared to the congruent condition. So as we used the, the static time window of 300 to 500 milliseconds, we can see that it's starting actually when we take this into consideration shortly before 300 milliseconds and it actually goes beyond. And also we can see that there's a small deviation between the 0.6 and 0.7 where the lines are almost approaching again. 
So from this group average, we can determine quasi-stable states. And we identify eight maps or eight prototypes that can then be also a, a backtracked, backfitted into the individual um, condition. So if you have in mind the GFP images by condition, we can those apply on the single subject level. And what we can see is that map one on the left-hand side is um, representing the area around the peak. This is uh, characterized uh, by higher frontal activation, but also map five is highly represented. This is also a more frontal activation, while when we have a look at the incongruent condition, we can see that there's a transition by using map four, and also the peak is now occurring in map, th uh, map two. So there's a transition more from frontal to parietal areas. And this is something that uh, we could identify again as a typical M400. Um, and we would have to have a look at uh, each learning strategy again to see whether there's a significant difference. Same for the combinations to see whether uh, this can be um, reduced to, to, uh, to the initially introduced um, potential outcomes to see whether we can identify uh, typical characteristics to um, design mobile phone applications using um, learning strategies, not just for entertainment purpose, but also to use learning as the priority. To summarize the results, what we can see at first is that our results show for each performance, whether it's behavioral as well as the N400 effect, that there is an improvement over time that could be identified as learning, while the N400 also increase, we do not identify modulation when we apply the learning strategies or we are split down to the learning strategies and also not uh, based on the combinational level. Uh, as of now, we cannot find evidence for the initially introduced potential outcomes. And this also uh, highlights the, uh, the way how learning strategies in terms of uh, mobile phone application design um, should be applied. Uh, as of now, the way how it's done is um, they usually combine all of them, the more the better. However, it's not sure whether this actually is of benefit when it comes to learning. So my speculation is more that um, the priority of learning um, applications is not necessarily to address learning per se, but it's rather entertainment purpose or to um, make the user uh, more motivational to use the application and eventually uh, at last it is the repetition that makes the difference whether you learn a language or not at the very end i would like to thank michael who is now virtually uh, at least attending uh, and also gave the introduction um, also for my co-supervisors that is thomas Weber, nicola roten at the uni distance uh, institute in brig and for the uh, project uh, contribution of uh, Sandy Marker and Simon Gorin. So much about my Thank you very much. My, I can open the floor. I have one question, maybe I, I missed it. Uh, I was wondering if you, in order to compare the impact of different strategies, you couldn't simply use behavioral measures. Like how many words were simply remembered after the list? You showed the pre post, it improves exactly. with different strategies. Are there differences or no? No, no, not at all. There is no main effect nor interaction effects when we use combination of retrieval practice with another learning strategy. Um, it could also be because of how the participants use the app. Um, of course, we gave instructions. Uh, afterwards, we had to adapt some variables. Um, because here I only determined in the beginning um, that we distinguished in terms of retrieval practice high and low. The aim that we asked, um, there was a software company that was um, asked to uh, design the app. We asked to have a specific ratio, for example, 70 to 30. So for each word, if uh, the word occurred, for example, 10 times, um, it occurred, for example, three times as only encoding and seven times as retrieval trial. However, this could also be manipulated by the user because in the beginning, participants could identify, um, do they want to use 
the audio setting or do they want to dis uh, disable it? Same for the microphone setting. So if they turned off the microphone, this also reduced the entire sample and there we had kind of an imbalance and therefore I adjusted the level and this um, affected the signal, uh, the, the, the entire result um, because if uh, participants would have used it as instructed, then the results would look different. Then we, I think at some point, at least on behavioral level, there was significant effect, uh, but this diminished after shifting the, the, um, the threshold. And, and another question, um, so you clearly you've tried different strategies to uh, well represent the average of the different, uh, of what happened in different individuals. But it could be that some strategies work only on some individuals. We're all very different in our ability to learn languages. Yes. So are there any follow-up projects or continuation of your analysis in this direction? Yeah, actually, um, the goal was to use this application um, in primary schools. So we introduced this application starting in third grade to sixth grade, where the first time, at least in the Canton of Valais, um, either German or French is introduced. So we uh, offered this application as an additional tool uh, to the regular strategy use of using textbooks, flashcards, or anything on top. And we identified um, that the behavior of using the app, there was, of course, individual differences um, some liked some strategies more. Of course, children uh, have a specific preference, uh, but this was only for classroom meant originally. Um, and their individual differences were not considered. Um, nowadays, it's also, at least you find a lot of applications that are already available that offer also um, the use of artificial intelligence. So adjusting um, the follow-up uh, presentation but that's something we did not use because we wanted to strictly control for each of the presentations. Uh, we also were uh, taking into account that each strategy is already used outside of mobile phone application use in classroom. For example, using vocabulary tests in a written format or an oral um, exam. Um, so this already happens. And we wanted to just transfer what is already existent into a simple um, mobile phone application. Uh, also in classroom testing, individual uh, treatment is also the factor that is ignored most. Um, teachers get quite creative when it comes to uh, adjusting to nowadays teaching to also offer more differences and variability when it comes to learning. For example, um, one teacher told me that she spoke into a microphone and recorded her own voice of speaking all the words so the, uh, the children had a representation. Um, in terms of uh, auditory input as well, um, and took all the efforts to uh, uh, create flashcards and vocabulary lists. So we try to facilitate this. But unfortunately, uh, in, in terms of school, we have less, we had less control at least, um, because there we cannot, well, as in a controlled study, we cannot ask them to use the application um, just five minutes every day. That is also what commercials of um, on mobile assisted learn uh, language learning apps do. It only takes 15 minutes every day to learn a new language. Children are not very consistent. <laughs> so that's a bit trickier. So there we have to see whether it actually makes a difference, but also uh, we could not control for which device do they use. Is it a textbook? Do they use flashcards? Um, we use the survey to assess this if they use also other tools. But children in that age are not even able to know what they did in the past week. Did they use flashcards or a mobile phone application and how often? What we can use is, however, we can correlate their estimate with the actual app time. And so far, there was no correlation as far as I remember. So it's going to be a, an interesting approach to see how this will end up. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Otherwise, I can give you one last uh, take home message. If you plan to use uh, a mobile assisted language learning application, none of them is actually really using or boosting learning using those strategies, but none of them is actually really bad. So um, I would advise try using what uh, is most user friendly for you. And any advantage to be expected in using more than one or we we'll stick with one? Well, 
I tried several and they all try uh, to have a specific uh, theme. I can, for example, show you that Rosetta Stone, um, which I use for several languages, uh, the setup for all languages is the same, um, but they claim you can, uh, you can learn a foreign language the same way you learn your mother tongue by not having any translation. So what you see is image, the, the four in word, uh, the spoken version and the sound. So it's a bit tricky. It takes more time, but eventually it's also efficient. If it's on your physiological or at least scientific level benefit, that is still open because there has not been any comparison uh, of multiple applications, nor as you can see, there are quite a lot. <laughs> Comparing them all um, is, is kind of way too complicated. So for example, the bottom one that I used uh, for a while was Rosetta Stone. As far as I know, um, Bubble is quite famous on TV and commercials, but also Duolingo is really favored by a lot of uh, people. So um, the context, what they use is also um, using the flashcard system that you see something on top and basically then representing the bottom. That's also what we try to implement. Um, like I said, they address different foreign languages. Uh, I would suggest try out what works best to you. At some, you might not even like the design. Um, for some, you might uh, prefer some, um, for example, the microphone input. Something we notice is for, uh, for example, Swiss native, Swiss German speakers, um, a struggle because we use the microphone input from Amazon and this does not really identify Swiss German. <laughs> when it comes to French, it's maybe easier. <laughs> um, so it's those details. Does the microphone work as expected or not? Um, we had some difficulties making sure that this works. Um, every, uh, every application uses it a bit differently in terms of evaluating um, the response. Um, but they all combine learning strategies in some way. It might even be the case that you don't like any of them and you stick to the old school way. If you think back 20 years when mobile phones, at least in school, were not even used, you stick to having a list of uh, a sheet of paper with only word pairs. Um, you have your book, you create flashcards, and somehow this worked. <laughs> Thank you very much.